Praise the Lord, my colleagues and students of Christian Service Training Institute. Welcome to the Book of Acts. Well, you're living the Book of Acts. And welcome back into part number two of Book of Acts. You've already studied the first 12 chapters thereabouts, and now we're advancing chapter number 13 to the end of the book, chapter 28. And I'm uh, Brother Dan Butler and your instructor for this course. Now, originally I had planned for us to sit together in a live uh, classroom with students from Bellflower. And it had been so nice to give the students in Bellflower a live classroom setting because uh, they have not had a single one so far. They have been some four years dedicated into the program with every single viewing being that on video. And it's been great. They've loved it. There's no complaint whatsoever. But I thought it'd be a nice treat to give them a, a live instructor. And so we tried to do that. Of course, COVID has knocked the props out from under us on so many things. And uh, then additionally, we had some issues this, this most recently, the last couple months. And consequently, here we are, at least at this present time, just doing a full-on attention between me and you via the camera and the, the internet. And so I'm excited you're here, though. Thank you for prioritizing the Word of God into your life and being one that delights in the law of the Lord and in His law, meditating day and night. And so you're going to be like the tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth life and brings forth fruit in its season. And uh, your leaf is not to wither, and whatever you do will prosper. Of course, I'm quoting uh, Psalm chapter 1, and verse number 1 says, You're blessed. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but your delight is in the law of the Lord. In this law... You're meditating, you're dwelling, you're thinking, you're considering. And so, of course, Book of Acts. Book of Acts, the second part. And just by way of quick introduction, I'm Brother Dan Butler with a background in terms of my education. Some of you may not know me, and I'm excited to get to meet you. And so I graduated from Purdue University with a major in biology and a focus in pre-med a pre-med student in 1978. Wow, I graduated. And uh, then I, I got a, a Master of Arts degree from Vanguard University here in Southern California and uh, with a focus into biblical studies. And then I have a Master of Divinity that uh, was earned through Fuller Theological Seminary and then a doctorate of ministry through Fuller Theological Seminary, and I'm so grateful for the path in education, but I'm far more grateful for the ministerial experience and the life experience. I got the Holy Ghost when I was eight years old. I'm excited to have journeyed now for these many years. What is it, 50, what, uh, 55 years? <laughs> Uh, being filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, raised in the church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Brother Urshan, Nathaniel Urshan, was my only pastor that I really knew growing up. And then uh, from there, I went to Jackson College of Ministry for a short season, about a year, and then off to ministry, full-time ministry in the Dallas area with Brother Jack Dehart. And then I evangelized for about a year, my wife and I. Uh, we were married when I was with Brother Dehart, and then uh, we evangelized about a year, took the church in Birmingham, Alabama, pastored there about three and a half years, and then I went to headquarters, served in the home missions department. It was called then, now it's uh, the North American Mission Apart Department at headquarters. I served as general secretary for almost seven years and then came to Southern California. Hallelujah! Where that I've been planted, I believe, in the vineyard of the Lord, the most ripened harvest field in the world. God has brought the world to our doorstep. I'm excited to be ministering here with you 
in uh, Southern California, and uh, it'll soon be 30 years of pastoral ministry that I have been involved here locally. And I'm excited, of course, to be involved in CSTI. I'm thrilled with CSTI, so grateful for this gift. It's been a blessing into our local church where that I, I think it's about five years now we have ran a satellite campus and uh, very successful with, with uh, about 20 students now in our satellite campus under the leadership of Brother Lucas Schultz. Appreciate so much the students <laughs> and our leadership locally, but also thank God for the wonderful leadership that we have in SoCal District. CSTI is owned and operated by SoCal, so it comes right under the headship of Bishop Art Hodges. Our, uh, our district superintendent and then the district board as well as uh, the local leadership that oversees what's being done in CSTI on a regular basis. Our chairman, Brother Dr. Dev Lloyd, we appreciate him so much and Brother Elwood and the other that are involved. All these that make CSTI happen, <laughs> what a gift to SoCal. And not only to SoCal, but the oneness apostolic truth message worldwide as students I'm sure are participating from literally around the globe and so we welcome you we're excited to be with you and uh, we're going to walk through this course which is going to be nine teaching sessions and uh, then is going to be about 45 minutes each and uh, there'll be a review week at the very end and then you have to pass the test or you're going to have to take the course again and so it's not going to be a difficult test because I want you to pass and the Lord wants you to pass and your colleagues want you to pass and you're a great student. You're going to, you're going to do fine. God bless you. Excited you're here. And so the book of Acts, of course, is uh, the fifth book in the New Covenant, <laughs> the Second Covenant, New Testament, where the first four books are the Gospels that uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John give us the background concerning Jesus, and then uh, we find in the book of Acts uh, the history of the church. But in the Gospels, there's no record about the, any church being started. No one receives the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost was not yet given. Jesus was not yet glorified. And Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Comforter cannot come. And so, of course, he would go away, and that gives us the only book of history. Hey, that sounds kind of like a test question, doesn't it? The only book of history in the New Testament giving us the history of the church, uh, where we see people born again, where we see how churches are founded, and uh, to many of these, the epistles are later written. But uh, book of Acts is the book of history. So we go on to the epistles, which is the letters. And uh, the letters written first and foremost by Paul, the writing of about two-thirds of those ep epistles. And uh, then the rest written by other of the apostles. But we learn how to live the Christian life in, in the letters written to the churches or individuals who already have received the Holy Ghost. And so a couple examples, 1 Corinthians 1-2, to the church of God, which is a Corinth, or 1-1 of Ephesians, to the saints which are in Ephesus. And Romans begins the same way, to the saints that be at Rome. Uh, we discover the epistles are written to the Holy Ghost filled people and it's the book of Acts that's going to teach us about the history of the church. And so uh, Old Testament's before Jesus, they didn't have the promise. We come to the Gospels when the kingdom is promised and realized in Jesus Christ, but the Spirit is not yet given and it's necessary for Jesus to go away and be glorified in order for the outpouring of the Spirit that's recorded there in the book of Acts when people are born again, churches are founded, and then we go to the epistles and learn how we're to worship and how to live and, uh, but again, we're focusing now into the book of Acts. So book of Acts primarily falls into two parts. The first part is a focus on Peter. And uh, chapters 1 through 7 is ministry of Peter in Jerusalem and in Judea. And then in chapter 8, it shifts to Samaria and nearby Judea. And uh, then in chapter 13, we have the focused ministry of the Apostle Paul. Paul's going to carry this message 
the good news, the gospel to the ends of the earth. And uh, he is taking missionary journeys in chapters 13 through 21. And then chapter 20 through 2 through 28 is Paul a prisoner, first in Jerusalem, then in Caesarea, and then in Rome. We have the focus on Paul. So the uh, second part here of Acts is primarily a focus on Paul's ministry. But the entire book follows the outline given to us there in chapter 1 and verse number 8 of Acts, that you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. Uh, That is the Greek word that we also get the word martyr from. You shall be martyrs unto me. You'll die out to yourself. And literally all the apostles died by martyrdom. Uh, You may debate John the Revelator when, of course, he didn't exactly die through martyrdom, but of old age, but, of course, attempted martyrdom, boiled in a hot bowl of boiling oil, and uh, finally placed out there on Patmos when he was left to die. But anyway, uh, you're a witness, you're a martyr to me in Jerusalem and then in all Judea and in Samaria. And then to the ends of the earth, you are a martyr to me. As we outline the book of Acts, being first of all recognizable with a geographic expansion, and then secondly, it's a cultural expansion. So in terms of geography, uh, look there, you can see Jerusalem, and surrounding Jerusalem was the region of Judea. And then to the north comes the region of Samaria, And uh, then into the regions of Samaria, the gospel would expand and then finally to the ends of the earth. And so interesting, thirdly, that we watch a historical restorational type of a rewind. And so when we watch the Old Testament bring to us truth of God, we see that it's involving the entire nation of Israel. Of course, Israel split into uh, northern southern kingdoms, two different kingdoms, and the northern kingdom became known as Israel and uh, later then collapsed into what could be called Samaria. All that would be left of Israel would be a watered-down, polluted sense of Israel being only residual Samaria But then in the south, the kingdom of Judah remained until 586. Northern Israel went into captivity 722, was obliterated by the Assyrian Empire, cast into the four corners of the earth, and never to be realized again. It was was, uh, the lost tribes of Israel, except what God restores miraculously. It's powerful what, of course, the Lord promises. However, uh, 586 B.C., starting at 606, first deportation, 596 second deportation. 586 B.C. is when you get the final deportation of the Jews removed out of Jerusalem into the land of Babylon. Then, of course, 70 years they would live there, return back to Judea, to Jerusalem, and rebuild the city. And so, but we watch now God revisit the Jewish people first in Jerusalem and then going to Samaria. So we watch the historical restorational, I call it the rewind, as he goes back to Samaria, back to Israel, to the reestablishing of Israel. And then again, we're going to watch this incredible message touch the four corners of the earth to the ends of the earth. And literally that's been God's design, God's program from the very beginning for all Gentiles to be blessed and saved. And uh, so we realize that this is, of course, what God would do. Uh, Acts is going to give us the record. So when we look at Peter's world, we see it quite narrow, focused primarily around Jerusalem. And then to Joppa, he ends up later in Rome as a prisoner. We know very little of his ministry there. Uh, But Paul, of course, would be broader in ministry and scope to uh, the basically the basin of the Roman Empire. And so interesting, again, if you want to note how uh, in Acts chapter 16, starting at verse number six, 
Uh, they had gone through Phrygian regions of Galatian, but they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Note, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the Word of God in Asia. They, it feels like they intended to go to Asia, but, but they, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them to even go to Bithynia. So, passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, and a vision came to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. So Macedonia would be that northern part of the Grecian Peninsula, uh, right square in the middle there of your map. Over on, the, on uh, the left is the boot of Italy, where, of course, Rome would be right at the very top of that arc of the black circle, uh, the city of Rome. And, uh, but it, the Roman Empire advanced towards the east and took in the ancient Grecian Empire. So right there in the middle of the circle is Greece at the lower end of the peninsula. And then just north is Macedonia. And so here comes the vision to Paul. Come over into Macedonia and help us. And so it's interesting here that into the Roman Empire, right into the very essence of the Roman Empire, uh, is the invitation to come and bring the Word of God. This Roman Empire was pristine. Uh, it was for the elite. It was for the culturally advanced and what have you. It's the inheritance of, of the Grecian Empire. However, in the decline of the Roman Empire, it would be attacked by the barbarians from the north. It would be uh, ransacked and uh, conquered by uh, the European barbarians, as they were called, the Vikings also, and uh, left uh, just the Roman Empire ransacked. And it would begin to rebuild on the crumbled pieces, literally with the church being central in the government of what would be left. Uh, but then uh, it would yield itself, give itself to a system of government that we call feudalism. Feudalism being kings that would live in a castle. And then uh, there would be serfs or servants serving the king and his family. And so the feudalism would be, next to slavery, the most socially, culturally depraved, economic, cultural system in human history. That's where the gospel went, by God's design. God said, I'm taking the gospel into the elitism of the Roman Empire through the season of its collapse. It'll be the very seedbed for feudalism. And then you would expect out of feudalism, nothing could come. But of course, we realize Christianity is going to emerge out of that essence of medieval era, medieval times, and then influence the world with a global impact to announce the predominant religion of the world. And so we see how that Peter and Paul, primarily Paul, influenced their world with the gospel and here's a question. What would have happened had Paul done as he wished and gone into Asia? Because of the lack of what was done in uh, Asia, it left a void wherein around 500 plus years later, Muhammad comes with a message that you and I can call Islam or Muslim faith. And uh, there it filled the void and uh, has reshaped our globe today. But of course, Peter and Paul are influencing the Roman Empire and literally Rome itself, of course, by the design of God. So now, when we look at our world in comparison to Peter and Paul's world, isn't this something to consider how expansive the globe is in comparison to the work that was concentrated by Peter and Paul. So it's the Lord speaking to us, lift up your eyes upon the ripened harvest field for they are ripe and, ripe and ready to harvest. So how can we live without a burden for the lost? Certainly we do have the burden for the lost and that's why you're in CSTI and you're studying the book of Acts and learning the history of the church and how to apply it, how to apply it to your life. So...
When we look at Book of Acts, let me just, uh, by again, overarching overview and introduction, mention some of the most important passages in Acts. So the most important passage to the Book of Acts itself is Acts 1 and 8. And uh, then to us would be Acts 2.38, and then to the early Christians, Christians would be Acts 7.51, and then uh, the early Gentile church, Acts 15.29, and to Luke it would be, uh, you see the references there on your screen. So let's look at these and see what they say. That of course, uh, to the book of Acts, you have the outline of Acts in chapter 1 verse 8, that you're going to receive power, power being the keynote by the Holy Spirit, that's come upon you, and you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem. Here comes the outline, the cultural, the geographic outlines to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the world. So Acts 1.8 is the outline for the entire book of Acts. Most important to the book would be that outline given. But then to us, well, <laughs> to us, what could be most important? There's several passages, but how about Acts 2.38? Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, then what about to the early Jewish Christians? How about Acts 7.51? How Stephen preaches... now. Can you believe this can be considered the most important passage to the Jewish Christians? That Stephen, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Well, then how about to the early Christians? Acts chapter 15 and verse 29 is going to show us that as Gentiles, primarily the Gentile Christians, uh, are given a summary notice no longer to necessarily follow the rules and regulations of the Mosaic law, but simply four commandments abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled in sexual immorality, and uh, pollutions to idols, another way of saying those things offered to idols. If you keep yourselves from these, you'll do well, farewell. That's written in the letter that was to go to the entire... Hellenistic Christian world, the Gentile world, uh, resident there in the Roman Empire. And then, how about to Luke? What can be considered most important? Well, uh, Acts chapter 25, verse 26, and then 26, 32. This may give us insight as to why Luke really took on a burden to write what he did to Theophilus. So the very introduction of, of Acts follows the introduction to the book of Luke, both text written by Luke and addressing Theophilus. So debate continues as to who Theophilus is. It's a Greek word, Theophilus, that means uh, Theo, God, Phyllis, lovers, or lovers of God. So just to lovers of God, the letter comes. Or maybe it's a particular person, or maybe it's a particular church, or maybe it's a locale called Theophilus, but we really don't know. But regardless, <laughs> whoo, it's written to us, uh, still impacting us today. But why did Luke write the book of Acts? Uh, book of Luke, he tells us, because he wants to give a, a more clear his own perspective of the life of Jesus. But maybe book of Luke is the foundational uh, compound text to book of Acts. Customarily in the day of Luke, uh, great writers would use compound text, a, uh, a, uh, a, a section one and section two. So um, Iliad and Odysseys, for example, uh, and uh, other great ancient writers Luke would look up to. And anyway, we have the book of Acts, but why did Luke write it? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 25. We'll come back to this, verse 26 and 7, is, is when Festus says, I have nothing else to write to my Lord Caesar in Rome concerning Paul. Therefore I brought him out before you, especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner to Caesar 
and to not specifically lay out the charges against him. So, of course, Paul has appealed to Caesar. He's on his way to Rome. Festus doesn't have charges to bring against Paul, so he's trying to get Agrippa to help him. So Agrippa hears Paul, and then Agrippa, in a summary note, this is probably the most important piece to, to Luke anyway, is when Agrippa, one of the own, their own Roman leaders, says to Festus, this man might have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. We'll talk more about it, but these are important passages uh, in the book of Acts. So now, I'm going to go to a couple different uh, sites, and uh, they're there on the screen. And uh, in your notes, you can go dig through it. This is just to help us see how Book of Acts is, is seen, reviewed by a couple others, and then we'll shake it down from here. But the book looks primarily at the two apostles, Peter and Paul. And the book is uh, appearing to have a narrow focus of providing a historical account of the spread of the gospel to Rome itself. It may also have an apologetic beat, but it also provides a background for the epistles that formed the New Testament Scripture. So one may divide the books. Uh, the book of Acts is Acts 1 through 12 with a focus on Peter, 13 to 28, the focus on Paul, and divide the book around the expansion of the gospel in Acts 8. So in Acts 1 verse through to, to 6, 7, it's the witness in Jerusalem from 6, 8 to 9, 31. It's the witness in Judea and Samaria. And then in Acts 32 to the end is the gospel to the extremity of the world. So what are the themes of the book of Acts? Well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Some 56 times out of a total of 259 times you find the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. You find it in the book of Acts. There's more references to the Holy Spirit in this one book than what there is in all the Gospels put together. Romans, with the next uh, uh, most references, has only 28. Acts provides a good view of the role of the Holy Spirit. And that's to work in our lives and Acts is going to tell us that the filling of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time occurrence. Rather, it has to do with the power for us living, living effectively unto God. Second theme is that the sovereign acts of God. God is in charge. So I pray to God we let this just settle into our spirits that there is a sovereign God that's in control in this world and doesn't matter what goes on in the country, the world, the globe, the city, the society, the job, the family. Uh, ultimately, there is one God that's in control, except He gives the human heart the privilege to choose. And uh, you and I can usurp God's will in our own life and seek our own will. Of course, that's why we're sitting in this class because we want sovereign God to be sovereign as well in our lives. But we see it op Him operating, God Almighty operating in Book of Acts, protecting and advancing His church. The miraculous deliverance of the apostles from fr prison, from the mobs, from everything that beset them, as well as God's work in opening the hearts of people to the gospel. There's the witness of the church beginning in Jerusalem and then going everywhere that the people went, to Samaria, to Ethiopia, to Caesarea, to Damascus, to Tarsus, to the Gentile Cornelius, to Phoenicia, to Cyprus, to Greece, and then to Rome. The church expands and expands. A third theme is the witness of the church as we lift this out of the website here, Truths. Uh, truthsaves.org. Witness of the church, third theme, uh, began in Jerusalem, continued everywhere that people went. Again, to Caesarea, uh, to Damascus, to, to, to Tarsus, to uh, Cornelius, to Phoenicia, to Antioch, to Galatia, to Macedonia, to Greece, to Rome. Church expands and expands by the witnesses of the church. So God is sovereign. God's working, God's expanding, but as a complement, of course, are you and I, the people of God, being involved in advancing the church. And then uh, the fourth theme, 
the apparent transition from the Jewish church to the Gentile church. So except for two occasions, the antagonist always appeared to be Jewish. Interesting. There's a list of verses, of scriptures, and a Jewish sorcerer did not even convert. Uh, we do see Demetrius convert, but at the end, Paul turns to the Gentiles. So over and over, there was an attempt to reach to the Jews first. Interestingly, Paul, the most Jewish of the Jews, became the apostle to the Gentiles, as is recorded in Galatians. Now, number five, uh, fifth theme is the book of Acts provides examples for us how to follow Scripture to be lived out in our lives. The direction of the Holy Spirit provided to God's people was an active and vibrant process, ongoing. Not some dead theology. The Spirit gave boldness and the words to speak, providing the warnings, the comfort, and demonstrated the reality of salvation that brought about healing and, of course, advancing the church. So number six, a theme in the book of Acts is salvation. It's described in Acts. It's demonstrated in Acts, the plan of salvation. And the nature of God's great salvation is seen and realized in the book of Acts. What are we looking at in terms of date? Well, sometime before Paul's supposed execution around 62 A.D., uh, Luke completed what he did in the book of Acts. He's apparently in the process of writing. And uh, there it's concluded around 62, potentially. Uh, as we look again, uh, drawing from truthsaves.org, there's a focus on, the, on Jesus at the very beginning of the book of Acts and then it converts to Peter. As we watch Peter's account in chapter 1, Judas' replacement, Peter is obviously the lead apostle. Pentecost and the birth of the church with Peter preaching, Solomon's porch and the results of the first miracle through Peter, seriousness of the spiritual gospel, the death of Ananias, Sapphira, as again, the spokesman here is Peter, the in and out of prison experiences of Peter and the apostles. We shift a bit to Stephen with a great uh, apologetic. We'll talk more about it in chapter 7. The gospel expands to Samaria and to Judea through Peter. And then there's the literary handshake, <laughs> the interweave that's going to introduce Paul in chapter number 9. Very, very subtly, as Stephen is stoned, or we, have, we have those coats laid at the feet of Saul of Tarsus in chapter 8. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 7, where Stephen is stoned. And uh, chapter 8, we do a flip over to Samaria. And then in chapter 9, it's kind of like we're finishing another part of the handshake as Paul's conversion experience has gone into through detail. What are we doing? We are slowly introducing Saul. Where do, who is Saul? Where does Saul come from? Well, we're going to realize that he was the Pharisee of Pharisees, that he's empowered by the Jewish council to go and to imprison, even to execute us. The coats were laid at the feet of Saul when Stephen is stoned. So the, the focus shifts from Saul in chapter 9 in chapter 10 to the Gentiles of uh, that being Cornelius and his household. Of course, Peter is the primary spokesman again. Peter's the primary spokesman at the first council in Jerusalem when we're going to discuss what we call the Gentile mission that's in dispute. We're, we are uh, disputing this mission uh, of the, the uh, uh, new Jewish sect religion going to the Gentiles. And uh, Peter's the spokesman there in, in, uh, in chapter number 11. Chapter number 12, Peter is in and out of prison. And uh, that is going to lead us to the death of Herod. And, uh, but then in chapter 12, verse number 25, all the way through the end of the chapter, we have reference to Paul. So how's this breakout? Well, we first of all have his missionary journey. We've already talked about his conversion. And uh, as the church is advancing, we go to the missionary journey in chapter 12 uh, through 14, where he goes to Cyprus, to Antioch, to Iconium, to Lystra, to Derbe, and then back to Antioch. So uh, rather than Jerusalem being the central focus of the missionary outpost and work, it's Antioch. So the church headquartering has now in chapter 13 shifted 
from Jerusalem. It's still in Jerusalem, obviously. But the missionary outpost is Antioch. And uh, we'll, get, we'll show you in a map here in a little while how Antioch is placed. And, uh, but now we convert attention back to Jerusalem for our second council. And this is extremely important when all the apostles are meeting together. Now it's interesting in this, in this discussion how as we're passing the baton, we're doing the literary handshake. Uh, we are interweaving Peter's ministry and foundational work and handing it off to the apostle Paul. And Kino right in the center here is... This Jerusalem council where Peter is not called Peter, but the reference is Simeon. Simeon hath declared. And uh, then we go on to Paul's ministry in uh, chapter number 15, the, the end of chapter 15, where the council chooses the companions to go with Paul to Philippi, to Thessalonia, Thessalonica to Berea to Athens to Corinth and then back to Antioch where they're going to report back in about the missionary work that's been done. Third missionary journey is Acts uh, 18 basically through 21 uh, when he goes to Ephesus and then to Europe and then to Troas to Miletus and then back to Jerusalem chapter 21 and then uh, in chapter 21, verse 17 through 26, 32, we have Paul traveling to Jerusalem, taking a vow to go and be purged, purified in the temple. Then he's arrested, and then we have his defense before the crowd, his defense before the Sanhedrin, his defense before Felix, his be defense before Festus, his defense before King Agrippa. Uh, this is all listed out here in Truth Saves. Now, now this slide is worth uh, taking a picture of, paying attention to. Uh, these defenses are keynote here. Defenses before the crowd, the Sanhedrin, Felix, Festus, Agrippa. And then finally, he's traveling to Rome, and uh, he stops in Crete, uh, Malta, uh, and uh, then finally to Rome. And so that's the focus upon Paul. Now, let's continue on in our discussion in our next time together. Thank you for being with me. I'm excited for our class together uh, in Book of Acts, Part 2. God bless you. <laughs>